Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. So while I know we're joining this call virtually, I wanna recognize that this digital space is one still bound by the colonial politics and systems that make up our physical worlds. And so it's important as ever to acknowledge that we operate on land that has been the home of indigenous peoples and nations long for colonial documentation of time, specifically the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit, people who continue to live and work here in what is currently known as Toronto or Takaranto. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, settlers, newcomers, folks who have been forced to relocate here as a result of the transatlantic slave trades and international forced labor trades, immigrants, refugees, and displaced peoples have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. For us at Tangled, we want to ensure the work of access and decolonization are always in relation, that they can work to help us in understanding the ways disability is enacted as a colonial construct and the new ways that we can resist this notion. In the spirit of resisting colonial impacts of ableism, I would like to invite us all to take our time in making ourselves relatively comfortable. Um, please use this opportunity to think about your access needs. If you need to make noise, move, take breaks, um, go on and off, you know, mute mic, whatever you need to do, get a drink, snack, please feel free to do so as we speak and move as you need in the space. Um, and we want to honor this land and the indigenous peoples who are here today and who have passed. We want to recognize that Tangled Arts operates under the dish with one spoon wampum belt, which is a treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe and a mutual agreement between nations for sharing land and resources. And importantly, we all have a responsibility to care for this land and for those who live here. A land acknowledgement is a living agreement and we are grateful to have this opportunity to bring light issues near and dear to our heart. And we are particularly drawn to highlighting some initiatives we're supporting. And so I'm gonna bring this up now for you, Victoria. Thank you again for, for everyone for your patience with the technology issues. <laughs> um, so one of the things we've been doing with our land acknowledgements lately is um, really trying to make sure that they're not just words and that we have concrete actions that go alongside them. So uh, what we've been doing is sharing these two resources um, so that you can go and learn more about some of the issues affecting people currently. Um, so there are ways you can support the Mi'kmaq Nation, uh, which is out on the East Coast right now. And they are, I'm sure everybody has heard about this, but they are, are suffering from um, uh, white settlers, um, harassing them, abusing them, assaulting them because of their uh, exercising of their fundamental constitutional rights. Um, out on the West Coast, uh, there are continuing issues with the coastal gas link pipeline being pushed through. Um, so there is also a link there. Um, both of these links have different ways you can support. So there are ways you can donate. There are voices that you can uplift. There's Politicians you can write to, and these links have uh, have have all of that information in there for you. Um, and what I will do is um, we'll get the links copied into the chat um, for you um, afterwards. Um, okay. Thank you. So, what's our next slide? ASL interpreters. Oh, did it not, uh, oh, did there, it not go? Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, this is another aspect of accessibility we'll kind of be discussing, <laughs> which is internet accessibility, as we move into talking about digital accessibility. Um, but as you see, we have two interpreters. Um, feel free to pin their videos uh, and let, you know, let us know if you have any issues with that. And we also have captioning avail available. Uh, uh, that will be auto captioning. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, sorry, Jack, I do need to interrupt for a moment because we have different captioning today. Okay. Um, usually we use the captioning that is the one that we have in our slides, but I realized last moment that it is the, the Otter AI one. So if you do need the captioning, please click on the link in the chat. But you, uh, if it is uh, not auto captioning, the way it is on the slide is how you are able to access it. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, this is our agenda for the day. Um, so obviously we started a little bit late, but we usually try to build in buffer time, um, both for um, just good event planning, but also to respect um, what we call crip time, which is sometimes our time needs to be a little bit flexible and things don't always start when we want them to. Um, mm -hmm. And also sometimes crypt time can mean we start on time and take our breaks when we say. So the way Jack and I work is uh, we're a little bit flexible with when we start, but we're, we're pretty good about uh, making sure we take our breaks when we say we will take our breaks. Um, because we respect everybody. We all need time to step away from our screens, especially these days, and, you know, get a stretch, have a drink, all of that fun stuff. Um, so uh, we'll be um, finishing up our intro, hopefully in around 10 minutes or so, um, and then we're going to move into Jack's uh, presentation on accessibility and outreach and relaxing spaces. Um, we'll move into a break for 15 minutes. Um, our middle section will be um, kind of like a primer on how plain language works. Um, and then we'll go into our second break. And then our last section, we'll be talking about how you go about booking and working, booking ASL and captioning and how you work with ASL interpreters and caption captioners. And then we'll go into our outro. Perfect. So how about, oh yeah, and then this if you. I have, Jack, was this me or you? I uh, is it, just cause I, <laughs> could you go over it? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, what we thought we'd try today is um, if you do have a question while we're presenting, you can hit the raise hand button. Um, there's two ways you can do it. Um, you can do it through clicking on participate participants down along the bottom and then clicking on raise hand. On this screen, it says lower hand. Um, that's because I wanted you to see the little blue hand on the screen. Um, or you can use a keyboard shortcut. So for Windows and Linux, it is Alt Y. And for Mac OS, it is Option Y. Um, and so if you have a question, um, Jack and I will be trying to keep track and we'll uh, let the speaker know and we'll take a pause and we'll, we'll answer the question. Um, we'll also have uh, time for questions at the end of each section, we hope. Um, Perfect. So, on that note, and recognizing where we're at, I think we have a perfect amount of time for me and Victoria to do intros. And then uh, when we're done, we can see if we have time, if anyone wants to practice visual description, if, if uh, maybe just a small handful of people wanted to also um, do just a little intro. So I'll start with myself. Hi, um, I'm Jack Hawk. I am the outreach coordinator at Tangled Art and Disability. I use he, him pronouns. I am uh, autistic and two-spirit identified. And today my hair is especially fluffy because I just blow dried it. It is black with blonde in the bangs and the sides with kind of a emo side sweep from 2003 because that's where I live emotionally. And uh, I'm wearing a black turtleneck with a gray sweatshirt over and two crystal necklaces. Um, 
Yeah, and so I'll pass it over to, for Victoria to do her intro. Um, so my name is Victoria Ann Warner. I'm the research coordinator at Tangled, and I am a, I identify as a uh, disabled, mad, queer woman. Um, and uh, for visual description of myself, uh, the, uh, just, you know, the background behind me is a nice kind of warm yellow with some geeky posters on the walls. I'm a white woman with long brown hair and kind of 50s style glasses on. And today I have on a green shirt with um, little sparrows sitting on, I assume, power lines. Um, <laughs> And I just wanted to mention, um, Jack and I did visual descriptions as a part of Access. Um, it's a good thing to include um, for low vision and blind folk. Um, so yeah, just wanted to say that's why we were doing that. Yeah, um, Victoria, oh. do you, yep, sorry. Sorry, I just realized I didn't say my pronouns. My pronouns are she and her. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Sometimes I, I forget the pronouns and I'm like, I'm being a bad trans person. <laughs> um, <laughs> Usually like good things to do is, is um, general descriptions are good. You don't need to do like overly specific ones. Give a good idea of kind of like a general idea of how you look. And also in Zoom meetings, giving a description kind of, of what's behind you is also nice. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So if no one is interested, I think we're just going to jump right into it and right on the mark, which I'm extremely impressed with, uh, I will say, <laughs> considering the technical difficulties. And I will say again, thank you so much for your patience. Um, it's definitely a part of why we're here today is we're somewhat limited in the programs we're using. Um, so again, hello, I'm Jack Hawk. Um, today, I'm kind of hoping the format of today is we're going to be starting with something that seems really simple, but can be kind of complicated to execute, which is ex actual accessibility and outreach and how we do that ethically and meaningfully, and then move throughout the workshop into something that seems extremely complicated, but is actually quite simple to execute in the end such as moving into playing language and booking, you know, digital captioners and uh, interpreters and things like that. So that's kind of where I'm thinking today. Um, so first we're gonna start out, I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm gonna start from the bottom and develop further as we go to welcome all levels of knowledge entering the space. Um, I'm gonna talk a little about what accessibility is, its primary principles, um, how to navigate what access means for you and your organization and how outreach strategies are impacted by access. Um, so, and I wanna remind again, just for one more time, is there's two options for, raise, uh, for raising questions, which is either you can use the raise hand function and I will answer your question at the end of the slide, or you can wait until the end of the very section and we can get into anything you want. And I welcome questions, discussion, points of interest, whatever you would like to bring to the table. So how can we define access? Disability justice scholar and activist Mia Mingus describes it in my most favorite way, which is accessibility is concrete resistance to the isolation of disabled people. I would say access is breaking down barriers that don't allow disabled people to enter and participate in a space. But I would also say that it's breaking down barriers that don't allow for disabled, deaf, and mad people to have agency and autonomy in a space um, and free will. In this way, when access is done right, it moves outside of logistics into something more impactful and meaningful. It changes the directions of human lives, the opportunities that they're afforded, the kind of social and professional connections that they can make, uh, access allows disabled people to be seen, heard, and felt as we are because disabled people exist everywhere in every part of the world, in every culture, in every identity group, in every other marginalized group. Um, but it allows us to be seen and felt and heard with intention, and I would say even with a platform. Um, it's important to remember that accessibility is a living process. 
uh, it's constantly shifting with the culture and when new ways to understand our own needs arise. The best part about access to me um, is that it provides a space for disabled, deaf, and mad people to congregate, discourse, and create by creating all of these opportunities. So if it seems like access is always changing and really difficult to keep up with, that's actually an extremely good thing <laughs> because it means that we are kind of having this space to be evolving at a very fast rate. I think I, I will talk about me and Mingus a lot because she's definitely like my uh, disability scholar crush as I think she is for most people, but she talks a lot about how a lot of the terms that she has coined she doesn't feel comfortable saying she's invented because there are things that have always been happening, but we just didn't have the language for it yet. And I think of access in the very, very same way. So I consider it that way when there's something new coming and I, you know, I have to really sit down and wrap my head around it that it's exciting rather than an obstacle. Um, but I firmly believe that in order to sustain ethical and cooperative mindsets when we approach access, we do need a foundation uh, to move forward, something to ground us in our ethics of how we approach it um, and how, you know, how language evolves from these age old ideas. So I, I think that if we focus on this foundation that Mia Mingus is talking about, that it, it should always be focused on bringing disabled, deaf and mad people into the mainstream and not just bringing them in, but welcoming them, welcoming them as active participants of our communities and our family members and fellow artists, um, we can always head in the right direction. So does access end there? No, access is extremely complicated while being very simple. Um, that's kind of my favorite thing about it <laughs> is that, I, but uh, so access is complicated because every individual has their own access needs and there is no one size fits all um, we'll be talking a bit about relaxed performance later on as we go into relaxing spaces. And um, a colleague of mine who is a relaxed performance consultant, uh, Jess Watkin, as some of you may know, she always says the lines, one person's relaxed performance is another person's anxiety performance. And I think that's a very good way to talk about access sometimes because you'll find a lot of competing needs uh, with access. But in my opinion, this is what makes it inherently nuanced and understanding of human complexity and not something to be afraid of or shy away from, but to celebrate about how we navigate accessibility. Um, and I think it's healthy for it to remain complicated and to never truly be easy um, because also if it became easy, we wouldn't need to depend on one another to develop it. And I think that depending on one another to create access is the most important part about it. Um, and then, you know, a lot of discussion talks about how access alone is not good enough. You also need this concept of inclusion, which isn't one of my favorite words, um, but to get more into how I mean it when I say conclusion, which is very much the autistic way of being, we kind of always have our own meanings to words and then use them, I use them incorrectly when I really mean one thing is really, I just mean you cannot have just access, you have to have a, a robust understanding of the people that you're trying to provide for. Um, you know, disabled people are a very diverse community. Um, we have all have extremely varied experiences. We, as I said, we're in every place in the world. Um, and you have to remember not everyone living with a disability identifies as having one or presents it visibly. Um, you know, I can speak from my experience as a trans and indigenous person, albeit, white passing, the cultural setting that you live in, the dangers of presenting your disability are quite different. Um, and, and you can see it, I mean, right, as the things we were talking about in the beginning of, it's dangerous to walk down the street as a black or indigenous person, let alone without the added implication of ableism, um, which, you know, to go into the fact that ableism is a tool actively used against racialized people um, and to commit violence against them. So presenting visibly can be very complicated. So providing access with, you know, this acceptance and inclusion becomes a broader thing um, and more nuanced. And to make the future truly accessible, our intent has to go outside logistics. Well, but what exactly does that mean? 
to go outside logistics. Well, here I am again to talk about Mia Mingus, <laughs> um, who again coined this term, access intimacy. Um, the greater overarching meaning of what uh, Mia Mingus coined is access intimacy is that, you know, I have a few notes on the slide, interdependence woven with community building and individual desires. On the left of the screen, you'll see a photo of this big tactile monster um, with a sewn put together heart in the middle. And that heart is uh, full of objects that the artist uh, was gifted by other artists during a residency, uh, the artist Valentine Brown. And there are hands touching the piece um, and coming together over this malformed sewn together creature in a way. And, and I thought this uh, photo really illustrated what me Mingus was trying to say, uh, which is, you know, she describes it as many things, a game changer, a queering of access tools, an elusive feeling, an antidote to loneliness and pain. Um, but ultimately, I like how she describes it here. Access intimacy is interdependence in action. It is acknowledgement that what is most important is not whether or not things are perfectly accessible, but rather what the impact of inaccessibility and ableism is on disabled people and our lives. When access intimacy is present, the most powerful part is having someone to navigate access and ableism with. It is knowing that someone else is with me in this mess. It is knowing someone else is with me in the never ending and ever changing daily obstacle course that is navigating an inaccessible world. It is knowing I will not be alone in this stunning silence. And that's, that's definitely my favorite way of her describing it, especially since the idea of access intimacy is not just about the interdependence between disabled, deaf, and mad people, although it definitely is, but it also uh, brings in the consideration that we rely quite heavily on non-disabled people for access. And so that intimacy is even more integral. Um, there's a lot of waffling in the arts, community, any service work. Um, about the levels of emotional involvement and labor we take in our professional lives. I would argue that when it comes to access and welcoming disabled, deaf and mad artists into our lives, circles and organizations, um, excuse me, <clears throat> that the profound impact we have on each other is too important to easily compartmentalize in just logistics. Um, I think that's also what makes it much simpler than getting bogged down by the anxiety of logistics and remembering that those logistics are informing a deeper relationship and that's why they're so important. Not to check off boxes, but because of the impact you are having on other people's lives. It puts you in the mind of understanding that if you're feeling, for example, it's hard to keep up with access tools, that means there are disabled people having a hard time keeping up with what they can access. It, it directly puts you in the, in the line of uh, co cooperation um, in, a, in a way, because for non-disabled people, access is optional. So building these relationships and investing in disabled, deaf and mad community means going somewhere deeper and going deeper means you cannot so easily turn back once it's inconvenient or costs too much money or, or things like that. And that way, it's what Mia Mingus also refers to as liberatory access. Um, deepening these relationships automatically puts more heart in the practice, even if the conversations themselves aren't heavy or emotional. And that interdependence questions the political vessel that we sit in. It goes against what we're taught and how we're taught to relate to each other. Um, I can say, especially living in Toronto, where you can easily dispose of someone, you can easily meet someone and just completely turn around and find someone just as convenient. It's very much the urban way of living and I'm sure it exists in many other parts of wherever you folks may be coming from. And I also think it goes against colonial constructs and it reminds me of a lot of teachings I've had where we not only provide something in this world but actively provide for one another, but not in this strange mystical racist image of the circle of life that reconciliation politics would have you bask in. Um, I would say the, it's more of this focus on daily routine um, 
daily routine interdependence. It's just a part of what we do for each other. And hopefully it can become something that's more of just a second thought. So on that very Sagittarius season preaching note, <laughs> I want to talk about how this plays out with outreach um, and how you can approach this meaningfully while also maintaining appropriate boundaries and relationships with the vulnerable groups, uh, sorry, <clears throat> vulnerable groups that you are working with. So what does meaningful outreach look like? This is just how I personally approach outreach. And I always say that I, I think it's good in outreach roles to have people within those communities in them, but all because most of the time those marginalized people have just been doing that their whole lives, learning how to make meaningful connections and find a way where we can mutually benefit from them. But I have outlined a few things here. Um, so I, I've outlined kind of my personal goals of outreach that I would like to share with you, which is to build relationships, improve communication, collaborate with community, manufacture opportunity, um, and targeted and relevant programming. These are my ideal goals for working with a community that has a higher need for services and opportunities and requires more commitment in our strategies. So especially when we work with disabled, deaf and mad people who are some of the most vulnerable folks uh, statistically and just in our daily lives even. Um, I, I do think outreach in many ways is about being a good conversationalist and being able to make people feel confident in their relationships with you and your organization. I think a lot of it comes down to we have to rethink the coldness of professionalism and really what that means to disabled people and uh, what it means for some of us who can't access professionalism as we've come to know it, um, whether due to language barriers, if, you know, say ASL is your first language and, and the professionalism that gets assumed sometimes uh, due to autism, uh, the oppression against deaf people, uh, you know, when they're interacting, how racism plays into professionalism. Um, and, and so for me, the key ideas of outreach is that when we're approaching people and organizations to improve our engagements and build our communities, we should be investing in one another, committing to the future, and making room for complexity. Um, the main question to me of outreach should be, why do I want to engage in this community? How can I do it in a way that benefits them and doesn't take advantage? What does my organization benefit from having the visibility of this community? And how can I approach that visibility ethically? And so I'm just quickly going to go through each of these goals. Um, so building relationships, for example, hiring within the community that you're trying to do outreach with. Um, and then you not only are supporting that person um, with resources, but you are providing them more opportunities and links to connect with their own community uh, which is a great opportunity as well. Um, and, but also, you know, there are the complexities of that, like making sure whatever position is prepared, for example, to have a disabled person in that uh, role um, and have the meaningful intent, intent of how you would accommodate, advocate, listen, and show up for that team member. Um, improving communication. This is also a point of access, and it does mean upping the game a little bit on different forms of communication you uphold. Uh, but most of all, being open and honest and flexible. We'll talk a little bit more about different communication methods, especially digital, as, as we move forward. Collaboration, bringing in community members for consultation, facilitation, audits, uh, paid opportunities, uh, bringing in people for committees and advisories, all, all that kind of work manufacturing opportunity. As arts organizations, you know, we shape the culture around us. So when we create opportunities for disabled, deaf and mad artists and uh, artists and cultural workers to create and develop their skills and network, it's crucial for allowing us and them to have a say in developing that culture. And, you know, we, I'll continue to talk about this point because I think it's perhaps the most important part about what disability arts is. Um, and then targeted programming, you know, what, what does the dis disability community need? Uh, is there a pressing one right now? Are your ideas of what is relevant outdated? 
Are you targeting it towards non-disabled people um, and, and their biases? This I find is a very relevant point, uh, even you know, for us at Tangled during the pandemic, especially as there's a lot of pressure to lift all the programming we had and place it in a digital box and uh, do you know due to pressures of funding and this and that, but really sometimes what has happened um, is there's not so much intention in how these programs get adapted, and it becomes not so targeted programming or, or not so helpful for our audiences. And so I do think a lot of that is constant connection with our community and consultation, providing avenues for your audience to discuss with you what they want, um, especially in times of crisis, which. To be crass, I, I feel like in the world we live in, times of crisis are signifiers of a world changing, hopefully for the better, but will most likely continue to happen. Um, and definitely will happen all the time in the lives of disabled, deaf, and mad people um, and any marginalized group you work with. And I keep using the word investment because I think we need to invest in the people and the communities we work with because they're taking all the risk in placing their trust in us as providers and creatives, and more specifically, people who hold all the power over the cultural shape our country takes. And so it's important to treat people as individuals as well as address the community monolith and not be afraid to get involved, while also understanding that sometimes our voices are not necessarily required as much as uh, it's there to advocate and support. Outreach should be a mutual give and take, almost in a way informed by mutual aid. You benefit from engagement, cooperation, and growth, and they will benefit hopefully from opportunities, a welcome space, and a place to connect with other people in their own community. So, you know, as we move forward, and uh, especially as disability arts grows, we're starting to see all new forms of access tools, things that, um, you know, people may not necessarily think initially as access. Uh, but the thing is, access is a creative field. Uh, so it, it's something we have to move outside of the limitations of the way our world works to create because we live in an ableist world. Um, so, I, you know, I have a few examples of things such as, you know, professional development. That's absolutely a point of access. Um, if, you know, if you're providing residencies and things like that. Art grants, the way you approach that and who you targeted to. Um, the actual venues that you put your events at, if you're working in heritage buildings, which are notoriously inaccessible. And also on the left, you'll see um, artist Saab Maynard's hands touching a piece of work that they created. It's another heart. You can see the care aspect as, as I keep talking about access. It's a heart uh, full and embroidered with like herbs and live products. Um, and again, I, for me, it just goes in the fact this is entangled. We always have a tactile piece as a part of all our exhibitions. And so I, I like using this as an example of when we think about access, um, it can inform our creative processes rather than make us feel like we're limited into rule structures. It, it can make our art practices flourish when we're trying to figure out how to create an audio description for a piece or how we want to make something tactile. So, you know, just something to think about. And the reason I bring this up is because new access tools are definitely relevant when we talk about relaxing spaces. So what do I mean when I talk about relaxing spaces? Well, I kind of have to talk about the practice of relaxed performance and its history first to kind of fully explain. Although the title is quite self-explanatory, there is some technical things about it. Um, so I'd like to talk about the origin. Uh, relaxed performance is a theater world concept. It's a show designed to welcome all audiences that would benefit from a more relaxed environment. Um, but very specifically, it was intended initially for disabled patrons, autistic youth, anyone with sensory or communication issues who would otherwise be unwelcome or have to limit themselves in harmful ways to attend. Um, in the way needing the environment to be what's often referred to with relaxed performance as extra live. And this can go, you know, between sensory accommodations uh, with dimmer lights, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, allowing people to freely move their body, uh, et cetera. 
relaxed performance has definitely changed a lot and its audience has also changed. I mean, we are now seeing relaxed performance at the uh, TSO, at major, major theater companies. Um, so I think I mainly just want to put the note out that it was developed um, and, and created with the intention and consultation of autistic youth. And yet you may see in a lot of dialogue and history and literature about it, that autistic voices are actually often very much left out of the practice. And so, you know, whether it is about relaxing spaces or relaxed performance, I would encourage you to bring on autistic consultants um, for that process um, and to kind of amend that lack of connection over something that was originally made for that audience. Um, relaxed performance is so great because it has created job opportunities for autistic people, um, including myself, and who may not have otherwise had the shot or the opportunity. So let's keep that going. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and just for a little bit of history about this, because um, it's pretty, it's re relevant. It was brought over originally by a company called Include Arts from the UK, who worked from, with like eight companies. And since then, relaxed performance has been adapted in Canada from the work of disability-led organizations. A couple to name are Inside Out Theater in Calgary, where Ricky Entz, who is one, I think, the only relaxed performance consultant who is also autistic, works. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Sorry, it's the interpreter. I need the name again. Uh, Ricky, R-I-K-I. Yeah. E-N-T-Z. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, who is, I think, the only relaxed performance consultant who is also autistic. Uh, Tangled Arts, we have been deep in the process since the British Council um, started working with Include Arts to bring it to Canada. Um, and relaxed performance, the main thing to take away from it, if, if you're not involved in the theater, is it involves a great deal of flexibility and adaptation, but that flexibility comes from set rules and foundation and clear guidelines and structure. So that intent is very important. Um, and I'm just looking at the time, so I'm gonna... So the basic anatomy of the relaxed performance is the visual story. Um, the, I will show you an example of this in a moment. This is basically a guide to the venue, um, the social rules of the space that you're entering. It, it's really just like a handbook to coming to the show. Um, I'll show you more in detail that. Pre-show statements, this will begin by reiterating the rules, reiterating that people are allowed to move freely and make noise and do as they please. Usually people will tell you what kind of sounds to expect and they will play the sounds in advance so they do not shock you during the show. Um, they will show you how the lights may dim or get brighter during the show, sort of exclamations that may happen or visual cues, things such as this. Technical adjustments, which again are the dim lights, less strobing, quieter speakers, um, clear indicators with costuming. Um, Sometimes, you know, it, it may even involve script changes to make certain things more obvious on stage. Um, a quiet room, which is where you would send people if they are overwhelmed and, and they could find a quiet, sensory friendly space where usually there's an iPad or a television that will have the show broadcast where they can have a moment of peace if they're feeling overwhelmed. Again, with those competing access needs of maybe you're someone who needs things to be really quiet, but you know, this is a space where people can make noise freely. It's, you know, so instead of shaming that, just having a, another space, another option. Um, and, and then just the established cultural shift of, this is not a place where you're gonna make eyes at somebody for doing what they need to do to get through it. Um, so I'm just gonna move to the next slide to show you a little bit about the visual story. And the reason I wanna focus on the visual story is because visual stories are basically my favorite thing in the entire world. And I don't think these have to be limited to relaxed performance. I think these should be used for everything, every, <laughs> everything in the arts. Uh, at Tangled, we use them for our exhibitions and our events. Um, and I, I, I would hope, and I've seen other organizations starting to implement them as well. I, Highly recommend it. I can tell you firsthand how much more likely I am to show up to an event if I have this kind of information beforehand. As you can see on the screen, um, I have an example of a visual story made by Christina McMullen, 
our previous communications and designs manager at Tangled. Um, she created this for a conference we held in February 2020, or uh, 2019, ignore that. <laughs> um, I was ahead of myself, uh, where we trained a group of people in relaxed performance and access. Um, and as you can see that there are pictures of the venue at different stages, such as when you're at the door, where the ramp is, where you can walk in through the hallway with brief descriptions of, you know, what the lighting may be like or where to find the accessibility buttons, where the coat check is, the kind of people and staff you might find around you. Um, I wish I could have a visual story every time I go to shoppers, <laughs> every time I go to the grocery store. I, I think this has been the one benefit of the pandemic for me as an autistic person is uh, more clear rules about where to stand, where to go, what to expect when I walk inside anywhere. And I'm hoping that these will remain integral and important and become informed by the disabled people who have developed them post COVID, even after a vaccine. Um, as we become more conscientious of each other, each other's health and how our bodies impact one another. So I'm just showing you another example of what these, uh, these include in this instance, they all, it's also showing you where the water fountain is, where the quiet space is, the safety protocols for the buildings. Often in these visual stories, you'll also uh, see a description of the staff, often with photos and bios so that people know who to connect with the name. Uh, how to use tickets, like like how to just how to navigate the space physically, mentally, emotionally, um, and I just think they're so fantastic. And so, why are we talking about this? Well, because I definitely believe relaxed performance extends outside the theater, and so do many other folks in disability arts who have been doing this work for quite a long time. Um, I think relaxed spaces have become a cultural phenomenon in the disability community. Um, and just to list a few spaces I have seen this now work at, I've seen it in gallery spaces, museum spaces, fine arts performance rather than just theater, workshops and talks as we're doing now, uh, co-working spaces, at Tangled we work with a very relaxed environment, um, which I'm happy to get more into and answer questions about, um, conferences, and that list continues to grow as people find creative ways to relax their spaces. Um, I feel like relaxed performance has shifted like a homunculus to meet the needs of many people. Um, that training we did in last February, there were a few people who are implementing this work. Rachel uh, Broussard uh, for the interpreter. Broussard is B-R-O-U-S-S-A-R-D, um, who works over in Saskatchewan, who is heavily involved in trying to make gallery spaces relaxed, as we also do. I tangled uh, Salima Punjani, so, so Salima, S-A-L-I-M-A, -A, uh, Punjani, P-U-N-J-A-N-I. You can tell spelling bees were maybe hard for me as a kid. <laughs> um, who she uses relaxed performance training that we gave her to apply it to therapy and counseling sessions that she does. Um, so really relaxed spaces has become a much broader uh, thing on its own. And so finally, we're here to discuss how do we relax our digital spaces? Um, and in 2020, especially where we sit right now, culturally, uh, with non-disabled people starting to see the importance and complexity of digital access, how can we bring a relaxed space to the digital world? And also how can we do it in a way where non-disabled people won't just forget about it once we're allowed to congregate together in the way we were before. So the most important hurdle, uh, hurdle to remember is we do not have control anymore over one person's environment. Uh, relaxed space is usually pretty much the opposite. Um, access providers control and monitor the space to maintain its flexibility. And that sounds quite contradictory, but that's really how it was when I was helping host the Access Activators training last year. It, it was a, you know, the structure to make sure that everyone could do what they needed to do and be where they wanted to be was actually quite complex um, to make sure there were constant fail safes and also constant 
giant bags full of pillows so people could lay on the floor and sit on the floor if they needed to, if that's what their body needed them to. Um, this is true of theater performances, this is true of conferences, gallery spaces, wherever you're trying to relax the space. This is actually a really different problem and quite difficult. And uh, one that I think we can be extremely creative about, but it's, a, it's an absolutely different way to think about access. Um, but I do think it is somewhat also similar to when we are dealing with inaccessible venues. Um, but the main thing to remember ab about this is disabled people have always lived at home and have always lived online. And we have always been isolated because of that. Uh, we have an opportunity to relax our mainstream and standard spaces now while we're kind of forced into the opportunity in 2020 as non-disabled people are forced to. Um, and we can standardize these practices so that everyone is welcome even when non-disabled people don't have to live online with us anymore <laughs> um, and regardless of how they interact with it. So it becomes even more integral and important. And so here we begin discussing the things you can do to relax your space and make it more accessible virtually. Not all of these are necessarily uh, restricted to the concept of a relaxed space. But for me, a relaxed space has broadened significantly in definition and audience. So in my opinion, the practices that we associate with it should. Um, you know, a good example of that was Theater Pasmerai did a performance of Bug with, uh, it was a relaxed performance and it also had deaf interpretation. I don't think there's any reason we can't move towards a world where those two things can be married and typical to be together um, with the care and intention put behind it. Um, so just to go over these things, um, you know, providing a clear agenda with expectations and integrated breaks. I think the breaks is probably the most important part of relaxed spaces online, because again, you don't have control over someone's environment, but you can control the amount of time they have to move within it freely. <laughs> and you do have control to give them time to adjust themselves and take a break and breathe. Uh, I think more than ever, the breaks are important. Uh, sometimes uh, we assume because I'm, you know, if you're in a meeting and you're laying in bed or you're at a seat that you don't need the break. But I think that uh, the fatigue from the screen, as you know, we've talked a lot about Zoom fatigue, but I, I think can be especially hard on deaf, mad, and disabled people. You know, the deaf person who has to stare at multiple moving you know, interpreter screens and screen shares all day, the adjusted person who's trying to keep up with all the different um, auditory inputs, it's quite exhausting. So the breaks are very important for disabled, um, deaf, mad people. Um, opening a session 15 minutes early and displaying the access points. That's actually something, again, <laughs> I bring up Mia Mingus again, but I recently on Twitter, she was saying before all of her workshops or conferences, she puts up a screen that sits and lists all the access points with the agenda. And that's up for 15 minutes as people enter. Um, and, and that's an idea I personally am going to start implementing into what I do. Sometimes it's easier said than done because as you know, you may have noticed how crypt time works uh, as disabled people, I certainly am not always amazing at being on time. That's my crypt time, but it's still, you know, I think it's still something to think about. Multiple modes of contact. So, you know, if you want to speak off mic, if you want to go in the chat function, um, recently I was in a committee meeting where we used a website called Mendy with a D I at the end, uh, dot com, where people could anonymously answer things and it would provide input for the person in charge of it. Um, live captioning in ASL, which we're going to have a whole section about, saying your name and then end of thought when you speak, especially in group settings. So, you know, hi, Jack speaking, and then when I'm finished, end of thought for those um, who are in the blind and low vision community who, you know, I, I think the shift to Zoom has been especially strenuous on. Uh, and, and then a few things about access that I, I think are important, especially if you are doing residencies online, if you are doing extremely long day long workshops, uh, anything like that, providing delivery food as a mean of financial access, uh, like, you know, Uber gift cards or providing them coupon codes or just delivering it for them. 
Um, and then internet accessibility, I think also is a huge part of relaxing spaces because how can you be relaxed if your internet is cutting out every five seconds, if your laptop doesn't work? Um, obviously this depends on you and your organization. If you're just a freelance worker doing a workshop, you don't really have control over this, but you know, if you're an organization with decent funds, like why not for a day, you know, give a little bit of data to the person who's facilitating? Why don't you loan Adobe products for the weekend or the week for an artist that you're working with? Just these kind of things to make people able to access things and not have to stress so much about the space that they're in. I think the internet accessibility, again, that's one of those things that isn't necessarily a part of relaxed spaces, but I don't think you can have the relaxed space without the secured um, financial and internet accessibility. But the most important thing to remember, again, I'm very into foundational principles and then moving forward with those, with the details. Uh, the most important part of creating any relaxed space, virtual or otherwise, is that in individual autonomy needs to be respected and celebrated. Uh, and you can do this in a digital setting just as you can in person. You know, no, I, I can't provide you a pillow so you can lay on the floor, um, you know, things like that. But I can encourage you to move your body as you need to. I encourage you to move and lay down on your own bed in the middle of a work meeting if you need to um, make sounds. Uh, uh, I think the option, making it optional to be on camera or on mic is a huge part of the relaxed setting as well. I, I think sometimes we underestimate the stress and anxiety and overwhelming nature of that. Um, you know, utilizing the chat function as a regular mode of communication for folks who aren't always comfortable being on virtual audio. Um, but also, if you are on, uh, actually, we'll get into that with ASL. Um, encouraging people to eat, lay down, exist however is comfortable. It's not like you're in front of me. It's not like I'm gonna have a scent issue if, if you have whatever food that you need to have. I think we can, we are in our homes and in a lot of ways, the, the beautiful thing about relaxing digital spaces is when we're, for example, in meetings or conferences is that we are being welcomed into each other's homes. So we, it's, it's a little silly almost to insist on controlling that, that environment. And then, uh, you know, certain things like perfecting tactile kits for participants in workshops, um, things like that. So I think we are reaching the end of the section. So I wanted to give about five minutes at least for if anyone had questions before we take a break. Am I correct, Victoria, that that's the time we're at right now? Yes, we have six minutes until break. Perfect. So if anyone has questions, you feel free to raise your hand or uh, you know whatever suits you. You can also put your question in the chat if that would make you more comfortable. And it's also okay uh, if you don't have anything. I also, yeah, so the tactile kits, that's also a, a, an interesting thing that, uh, sorry, the question was, what are the examples of tactile kits? So I know it's, it's flipping my mind what specific, uh, maybe Victoria, you remember as I speak, but I, I know a few people I know are doing things such as, you know, if they're having a workshop on a piece, they will send tactile kits um, of things that feel very similar to the artwork that the person can then touch and feel. Of course, the complications of this is COVID. We, we should sanitize everything and make sure everything is okay and safe and healthy, especially working with disabled people, but that's just an example of how people could have been working with it. Um, um, Jack, yeah. there's yes. also been this, there's this uh, artist in Quebec, mm -hmm. Archie Reed, and uh, what he did for one of his recent like workshops slash exhibits was 3D print miniature versions of all of the art and sent it out to people as like a, a, a thing. Um, <laughs> So I thought that was a really cool idea. I personally love that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so I'm gonna look over these two questions. Uh, one was, do you have any suggestions for supporting internet support for participants at public events? That's definitely very difficult. It depends on the realm of the event, like how large it is. Um, 
because I do think it's easier with private things and when we're working with our employees and, and colleagues and artists than it is public events. Um, I feel as though my inclination is if you can somehow, I, I'm still a little new to Canada, but I know you can buy like data cards for people um, and then people can use their hotspots for secure internet. That's one suggestion I have, but that's something I'm still trying to figure out. So it's a really good question for those big overarching public events. Um, moving on to the next question. For people who have chemical sensitivities, the scented products that other people use become a barrier to access in public spaces. How do we encourage awareness of this issue? Well, I, I know personally, for example, I always include it in the visual story and the access guide of any event. Um, at Tangled, we have it in the guidelines of our space. So when you enter our space, there is actually a sign that says, please no scented products. Um, a lot of it is, if I'm being frank, being very annoying about it. <laughs> just make it like, honestly, I, I'm someone who I'm not, I don't have a chemical sensitivity, but I, I'm just very sensitive to uh, scent. And I just, I, I, <laughs> I think it's also one of those levels of, even if it doesn't affect me so much, I can't leave the space. Advocating for it benefits others. So I, I just try to uh, pretty much educate every person who comes in. If I see someone about to spray something, I, I'm not afraid to just <laughs> totally point it out. But I, I do think for putting it in all of your uh, literature um, is a great step. I even put it on your website. If you're, you know, if you have a physical space or, you know, in your agenda, if you're doing a workshop as a freelance worker of anything like that, um, I think is a good place to start. I've even, uh, for events I've done, I've even sent out emails beforehand illustrating like here's a guide on how to be scent free because a lot of people don't realize that being scent free is more than just not wearing perfumes it's also a matter of you know the kind of things you're using in your hair and your laundry um so usually i'll send something out beforehand as well um yeah, yeah victoria yep um so we just wanted to add to that too like if you're working on if you want to improve it within your own organization um, it's good to like it's it's obviously the first step is having a policy um, that it's it's something you don't want people to be wearing when they come in. But another important aspect is talking amongst yourselves about how you handle it when it does happen, because it will happen. Um, so just having that conversation amongst yourselves, finding out like who's comfortable having those conversations with people, if it is a conversation that needs to be had with someone who's come into the space with scent on it yeah. um, because not everybody is comfortable um, and, and, or sometimes they might be and sometimes they might not be. So like having those conversations and just figuring out the logistics of how you're going to deal with it. Cause I can tell you like, as a person with asthma, I, I had to get switched in a theater show a couple months, like, well, not a couple, it's way more than a couple months ago because it was <laughs> before the pandemic. But um, the confusion from the staff on how to deal with the issue was one of the barriers. If, if, if the solution that we arrived at had, come, had, had happened much sooner and they had a plan for how they actually dealt with it instead of just a statement saying, please don't do it, but if you do, we're not really going to do anything about it, it would have been a lot more helpful. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I'm just going to read a couple of the comments that people put. Um, Rachel Marks said, on the tactile topic, I saw sensory box by Ghost River Theater last week. They sent us all boxes that we couldn't open until the show. And then the actor talked us through the opening and exploring the items in the box. It was very cool. I almost wonder if you're the one I heard about that from, Rachel. Uh, I also know the AGO was doing something like that, but I think that... I, to be fair, I think they were being informed by a deaf artist they work with, uh, Luna, her last name is going past me. Um, and then I'll read this last comment and then we'll take a break, uh, which was Barb said, I was gifted an air purifier recently that filters out VOCs, volatile organic compounds, uh, which are what affect people with chemical sensitivities. I was shocked at how many are in my home. It could be a good investment for organizations. It was a Dyson available at Canadian Tire to filter the environment before an audience arrives. Um, that sounds awesome. I would like to know if it's very loud is like kind of my curious thing about it because if it's quiet, oh, that sounds awesome. 
<laughs> I mean, I almost would want that for my actual home, especially living in uh, Toronto apartments that God knows what's in the air of uh, <laughs> when humidify. Well, that's a thank you. That's an awesome suggestion. I'm actually going to check that out um, because at Tangled, we have quite a small office space. Thank you. So on that note, I think it's time for a quick break. Uh, Victoria, you know what? I'm just going to go back, if it's okay, to the agenda to remind myself. <laughs> Sorry, everybody, for the visual horror of me going back. through the slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and then one last person. Uh, Britt J said, I witnessed an issue when an Indigenous theater production was doing a smudge ceremony in the theater space before the performance, and a, patient with sen a patron with sen sensitivities was very unhappy, tricky. Yes. I can speak very personally to that. I've definitely had that issue. Um, I had that issue, in fact, with the conference uh, I held last year with my colleagues, uh, Emma Campbell from the British Council and uh, Christina from Tangled and, and everyone else you're we working with who, um, it was a team effort, but it's definitely been an issue. I find how I navigate this is because um, I, I just, honestly, I, I warn people ahead of time there isn't, I, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about the science to know if there's any of that specific chemical in smudging, but I do think uh, th there does need to be a midway around it. I usually just warn beforehand that it's going to happen. So if people need to leave the space initially um, to deal with it, they can, but I do think it's an integral practice. Um, Andrea was saying there was an indigenous artist that made a smudge oil to help reduce the scent free aspect. Can't remember their name right now. Yeah, the only thing I would think about oil is that, that that would linger even more to me, but it's definitely a very complex access issue because, you know, as a, a two spirit person, I would say smudging is an access point for me. Um, and something, especially if it's going to be an anti oppression workshop or, or something along those lines, um, it, it definitely is required for me. So, and, and for people to just be aware of the space they're in. And anyway, definitely a very complicated conversation. Um, and in talking about those competing needs and the nuance of uh, meeting access. So let's break. You know, um, so uh, we're going to move into a kind of a brief overview of how you implement plain language. Um, it is a, uh, I feel like on my end it's both complex and not complex, but I feel like that is partially because I understand it. Um, so, but anyways, we'll, we'll move into that. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so um, plain language. So plain language is an attempt, and I'm sorry, if you hear any um, rustling sounds on my end, my cat has decided this is the moment to finish off her breakfast two feet away from me. Um, so Plain language is an attempt to help more people understand ideas that matter. Um, and I feel like this is also a really good way to kind of talk about one of the things that we try to do with art. Um, we're trying to, you know, express feelings and, and our histories and stories and all of that in a way where we understand it better as well as other people. Um, so I have this great quote from Sarah Luderman, who is a plain language translator and activist. Uh, we build palaces out of words and then we fill the moats with crocodiles and poisonous snakes. Um, this is speaking to the fact that language is a barrier in all aspects of life for a lot of different people. Um, so, and this is no different than it is in the art world. And I feel like a lot of, a lot of you will probably understand when I say that we often add an extra layer of complication in the art world when it comes to art speak. 
Um, and this barrier as well is something that keeps coming up in the research that I've done and we've done it tangled with artists, with audience members and with arts workers. So this isn't just something that you do for people who are consuming your content. It's also for the people that you're working with and the artists that you're bringing in. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk about who uses plain language. So people who might need to access to plain language are disabled people, people who speak English as a second language um, and people who lack access to education or any combination of the above or all of the above. Um, an example of when language barriers might be a combination of reasons um, is within the deaf community. So unfortunately, so the, the first part to that is that people who have ASL as a first language have ASL as a first language, it's not English. Um, but as well, there are issues with uh, deaf children who are denied early life language development, um, as well as education in sign language. Um, so all of these things combine in towards needing access to plain language, but in terms of a lot of deaf people, disability has nothing to do with it. Um, so, our next slide. So what is plain language then? So, or well, sorry, plain language is. Um, so plain language is faster to read. It's easier to keep reading. Uh, it's easier to understand. And it's actually preferred over traditionally written documents. Um, when you see uh, plain language documents, it, it ends up kind of clicking in. And, and uh, I will say what I'm going to do is um, in our next session, we can look at things a little more deeply. There's a lot to cover in this one. So this one is a little more of a skim. Um, so we know what plain language is. What is, what isn't plain language? So plain language is not, so there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, so plain language is not oversimplified language. Um, plain language actually often removes ambiguities um, by removing excess words that you don't need, simplifying tenses, it makes the information easier to access to everybody. Um, it's not imprecise. I kind of already said that, um, uh, but plain language removes those, uh, those ambiguities. Um, it's also not stripped of necessary technical or legal information because plain language is not there's this thing that we do with like classics and that we'll, we'll do readers copies for younger readers. Um, but that's different because that is changing writing both into simpler writing, but also making it age appropriate. Whereas when we use plain language um, these days for what we're doing, we're writing it for other adults. And we need to remember that. Um, and plain language is not just short sentences and plain words. Um, it is a whole system. It also means looking at how you're organizing the work, how, uh, sorry, how you're organizing the information um, and how you're laying it out and designing it and yeah. Um, and it's not just editorial polishing, which I think is obvious from the previous things I've said, it is a whole process that can, it, it can be put into a document after the fact, but it is also, it's usually easier to build a document from the ground up using it and using the techniques. Um, so what can plain language be? Uh, it can be worked into existing documents that you already have. Um, you can create separate documents as a translation um, and it can be used, as I said, to write and create from the beginning. Um, so the things I would love for organizations to start thinking about is what kind of writing we're putting out and how can we make that more accessible? So if we have things that are already out there like our call outs or applications or our contracts, how can we then make that translation and make it more accessible? 
Um, and it doesn't need to all happen at once. Uh, as you've probably, if you were in the last session and you're in this one, access is complex and it has many aspects. So, so how do we implement plain language? Um, oh, so actually give me one moment. Um, I will go to the slide for a second too. Okay, so this is my fun example of some ridiculous language. There is no escaping the fact that it is considered very important to note that a number of various available applicable studies ipso facto have generally identified the fact that additional appropriate nocturnal employment could usually keep juvenile adolescents off thoroughfares during the night hours including but not limited to the time prior to midnight on weekends and or 2 a.m. on weekends. Um, so at the end of this deal, this one is glaringly obvious and it literally was written to be that way. Um, but I'm sure we've all seen language that looks like this in the past. And this one in particular can be summed up to more jobs keep youths off of the street. Um, so uh, when we start implementing plain language, there are two main areas of focus. So the first is the organization of your information. And the second is your writing. Um, so I'm going to give you some steps that you can follow when you're trying to rework something into plain language. Uh, these examples have come from both people who know much better than I do, as well as my own process and other research that I've done. Um, so when you're looking at translating a document into it, first, you want to look at organizing the information. Um, this is a very important part. And uh, I will go more deeply into these steps after this slide. Um, the second step is to check the readability and grade level of your writing. Um, it's important to remember that it's not a be all and end all on that, but it is a good indicator to use to start your work and see what you need to do. Um, you want to simplify and shorten your sentences. Strip uncommon words. And then a really important aspect is reading it out loud. I do this all of the time. Read it out loud. If it sound right and it doesn't flow, you know there's something you need to change. It's kind of like always, I'm a fan of rewriting things and reading it out loud and fixing it and going from there. So, okay, so organizing your information. When you start organizing your information, you want to put it in a logical order. So think about what, I spend a lot of time on this when I'm, actually I will say when I'm, when I'm creating documents, uh, I often, I, most of my time is spent figuring out what information I need to give people and how to organize it and what order to put it in. Um, so when you're putting it in that kind of order, you want to put your important information first and your background information later. Uh, best practices are usually, if possible, to use chronological order. Now, and this is something we can possibly talk about more in the next session, in the drop-in session, if people are interested. Um, chronological order does not, oft, it often does not work for creative writing. Um, so in those cases, instead of chronological, ooh, it's a tough word. <laughs> in those cases, instead of using chronological order, what people are experimenting is with is chunking through different themes and topics, but it is still something that people are trying to figure out um, because access is complicated. Um, and some things work for some things and some don't. And plain language doesn't really work for like poetry, for example. Um, use short sections. Um, I'm sure everybody kind of knows, say if you're reading an article on the internet, if you're hit with a wall of text, it's much more difficult to get through and find what you need. If you have short sections, it's helpful. And I feel like I should have altered these last two points when I'm talking about chronological order because we want headings to be ahead of the short sections to identify the short section. 
Um, so, da, da, da. and Sorry, heading. Yeah. Sorry, I was just curious. Um, do you think is it also? I was curious. Is it also helpful? So it goes back a little to reading it out loud. Is it helpful to uh, read it to other people? Yes. Reading it to other people, leaving it for a couple of days and coming back to it. Um, I know it tangled what we've done in the past is when we've been on a deadline um, and all writing and working on the same thing, we'll write something and then swap it with somebody else because you're too close to the text and you're too familiar with it. So either having a second set of eyes or ears or giving it a few days is a good way to get around that problem. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so headings will help your readers navigate the information, especially when it's things that people need to come back to. So like for application processes um, or contracts, being able to easily like skim and read and find the information they need is really helpful. Um, so how do you use headings? So there's, oh wait, so there's three types of headings. Um, the first type is question headings, which you have seen a lot of from me and Jack with our slides. Um, so question headings would look like exactly like I've done here. How do you use headings? Um, it, gives a, it's, it's, it gives a clear idea of what you're going to be answering in the section. Uh, the second type is statement headings. So add useful headings. These are still good, they're clear. Um, the last one is topic headings. So a topic heading for this one would look like headings. I feel like it is probably obvious that the um, clearest heading we have here is the top one. So it's good to try and stick with the top two depending on what you're doing and avoiding kind of topic headings unless it's absolutely necessary, but I don't think it usually is. Um, headings should also not be so long that they overwhelm the information. Um, and uh, with that, it's the focus on clarity, uh, but also like make sure you focus on clarity over brevity. Um, so, uh, headers will also uh, help readers skim, skim and scan information, um, understand the order of steps. Wait, hang on. I'm reading my notes from the next section. Sorry, guys. Um, sorry. So, um, so how do we organize complex information? So we can use lists to organize complex information. So. To create an effective list, you want to use a lead-in sentence. Um, actually, I'll stay there for a second. So with lead-in sentences and lists, um, as you can see, I basically have, it's an explanation of what the list is about. Um, and it's more effective than if I did like a, like a topic heading kind of sentence, it would just say effective lists. Instead, to create an effective list, Use a leading sentence. Uh, use no more than two or three sublevels. It just it gets too confusing visually and it's hard to keep track track of. And use parallel construction. I actually only recently learned what that was called, even though I've been doing it the whole time. Which is, if you look at the leading sentence and the lists, they all make a sentence. Um, so to create an effective list, use a lead-in sentence. To create an effective list, use parallel construction. If you make it make sense like that, it's helpful. Um, so this is where I wanted to say that lists will help your readers understand the order. Uh, um, they're an ideal way to present like items, conditions, and exceptions. Um, it just makes it easier to parse. So there are some tools you can do because I said, as I said, the after we organize the information, you want to start checking your writing. Um, so uh, there are two tools. 
um, that you can use. There are more online. You can look them up. I just I didn't want to clutter this up too much. Uh, so the first one is readability formulas, and they have these great tools that you can uh, just check the readability in different formats. There's a lot of different ways, like different types of grade levels, but it gives you an idea. Um, and there's also the upgoer six. Now, this is an interesting one because um, Upgoer 6 is not actually technically made for access. It came out of a comic on XKCD where uh, they, Randall Monroe, uh, do I need, would you like me to spell that? Um, Randall Monroe wrote a comic about trying to explain the Saturn V rocket from NASA using only the most 1000 common words, which is incredibly difficult. And so someone wrote a text editor to check that. Um, but then somebody else came along and made Upgoer 6. So what Upgoer 6 does is it checks how common words are by color coding them. You can also click on them and see. So it is not perfectly accessible. Um, I might be trying to conjole my brother who is a programmer to make us one that is more accessible. We'll see if that works. Um, so, uh, oh, I actually wanted to make a note about readability levels. Um, so there are different suggestions for what grade level you want to aim for. And they vary based on the study, who the study was, like who their focus was, um, so the recommendations vary from like third grade all the way up to eighth grade. And the reasons, so the lower reasons, uh, the, the, one, of the one of the plain language advocates I, I uh, really like recommends for fifth grade. Um, so the reasons for the lower ones are that studies have shown that within the deaf community, reading comprehension can be as uh, uh, around the third grade level at times. And that's because of the reasons I mentioned before about lack of access to language development earlier in life and a lack of access to education in a sign language. Um, so I feel like like a fifth to an eighth grade level is a good, good uh, spot to aim for, but it's not perfect and it's just a guide. Um, so once you are checking your readability levels and your words, you're going to start simplifying your sentences. So shorten your sentences. So uh, the recommendations are for written documents around 20 words per sentence. And for the web, it varies. I've seen recommendations from between 10 to 15 words per sentence. Um, so this can mean like removing clauses or splitting sentences up into multiple sentences, or sometimes it, all it takes is removing excess unneeded words. Um, use pronouns to refer to the reader. Um, so instead of saying, oh, hang on. My note on that, sorry. So instead of saying, um, unless, the payment is made, a, uh, a fine will occur. You'd say, you need to pay this payment or you'll be fined. It's much clearer. Um, use an active voice. So this was a really difficult one for me when I was a teenager. I was always getting those grammar recommendations saying you're using passive voice and I didn't understand it at the time. Passive voice obscures who's responsible and uh, um, active voice makes it clear who's supposed to be doing what. So an example would be like, the following information must be included in the application is a passive voice versus the active voice is you must include the following information in your application. Um, try and use the simplest tense, which is often present tense. It'll make your writing simpler, more direct and more forceful. Obviously it's not always possible, but when it is, it's good to use. Avoid hidden verbs. So 
hidden verbs are verbs that are converted into nouns. So it's when you do things like you say, please make an application instead of please apply. So you make a verb into, um, you make a, a verb into a noun by doing things like adding, uh, so instead of engage, it's engagement, instead of apply, it's application. So you add things like meant and shun um, to the end, or you link it with things like achieve or make or reach. So it's, you can see that in the example I gave, please make an application. We've done two things there to the sentence versus please apply. Um, and again, as I said, we can go into this in more detail next week if people are interested. I just don't want to be too overwhelming with all of this. Um, so keep your subjects and objects close to their verbs. If you're shortening your sentences, this should be easier to do. Um, just um, and use terms consistently. Um, so try not to use different words that mean the same thing. Um, I know I, in my writing, will often try to make sure I'm not being too repetitive, but when you're trying to write in plain language, it is good to keep your terms consistent. Um, so, oh, so we're going on to the second part of simplifying your sentences. And after this slide, it gets less heavy, I promise. Um, so you wanna cut your excess modifiers out. So like absolutely, actually, completely, totally, really, quite, very. And then in my notes, I wrote totally rad man cowabunga. <laughs> I think I was having a moment there, um, <laughs> but we don't really need them. Um, and I, I know for myself, a lot of the times, and I do this in emails, I try to cut them out. And sometimes it's because I think of uh, socialization, of trying to kind of hedge your words or make sure that they're like, no, this is important. But if your language is clearer, it is more direct and more forceful than it would be without it. So, and we should stop hedging our language and say what we mean. Um, so check your prepositions too. Um, of, oh, hang on. of, on, to, and on often mark phrases you can cut. So things like a sufficient number of, you can just say enough or be responsible for, just say must. In order to, just get rid of in order, just say to. At this point in time, you could just say now. It's it's much quicker. Um, so use transition words. So when you're starting a new section, you can refer, if you're continuing on about something in your previous section, use your transition words. So like this, that, um, these are pointing words, those, the, those are good to link back. Um, echo links, so you can echo words or phrases of a previously mentioned idea. Um, and explicit connectives. Oh, hang on. Oh, sorry. Um, and explicit connectives. So things like further, also, and however. And now I know some of you might be about to say, no, those get overused. They do get overused a lot, but they also sometimes get overlooked when they're useful. So. I think the the thought here is basically always question your writing and ask why you're using the words that you're using. And as I said before, the reason that happens with when they're uh, overlooked and is because we get uh, too familiar with our own writing. Um, so use must instead of shall. Um, it's, uh, it's just clearer. Um, minimize your abbreviations if you can. Um, and if you are using abbreviations, define them multiple times. Uh, you don't need to do it throughout the entire document, but do it the first couple of times and then you can go into using them. And avoid jargon. It's 
you know, I feel like that one's a little self-explanatory jargon for if if it's people who are coming in from the outside, it it's it's a huge barrier. Um, and I think I meant to say this earlier, actually, that um, with uh, deaf, disabled, and mad artists, we have extra barriers to the art sector because of the barriers we are experiencing in the wider world. So it's barriers like access to education um, and opportunities and experience. So often when people are, or actually um, as well, people who might not know what accommodations can do for them or what access looks like for them. And uh, so when people are coming into the art sector with those barriers, there's basically something that just keeps coming up of people saying how much difficulty they had at the start and that it got better over time. Um, but yeah. So I think, um, That might actually be my last slide for this section. I think I was a little bit, uh, I didn't want to overwhelm everybody too much because it is a dense kind of thing. But if um, anybody has questions, we can talk about it more. Um, Here's Jack. And we can also talk, I think, more about like, what do we do with um, creative writing documents and with like artistic statements and um, because sometimes it's very clear, oh, we have a contract and we can turn that into plain language. There's no question about whether or not we should do that. But what do we do when it's an artistic statement? Because an artistic statement is both trying to get information across, but it's also an expression of how that artist feels about and sees in their exhibit or whatever the work is. Um, so in some cases we can do just one document, um, but in others we may want to do two documents so that we can keep the integrity of the like the not integrity I don't know. we can keep that artistic vision intact while also still providing um, providing that translation. And I, I would love to see more artistic statements being translated into plain language, more exhibit statements, uh, more um, oh I can see the word in my head. like press releases and when we talk about when we're doing like our press releases like if we think about how we're how we're speaking and then who we want to be bringing in um so i think hi yeah i was curious yeah. um i was I, I was also just interested to hear a little bit more about the research you were doing with plain language uh it, it, what's the word not research but uh surveying you were doing? Well, there's been a few things that have come up over the years. So the first thing I did, I did like a, uh, I did a report two years ago on barriers to arts funding for artists. Um, and that was when it first started coming up. And people were just talking about how when they first came into the art sector, they uh, needed someone to help guide them um, that uh, and the reasons were varied so some people didn't have um, the education but some people did and had gone to art school but art school doesn't necessarily teach how you navigate the art sector and the art world um, so that was something that people have to learn once they get into it but as I said when you add more barriers um, so then the research I'm doing currently is a digital strategies uh, research. So we have been talking to 
our community members. It's it's we're talking to artists, um, audience members, arts workers, and volunteers that have worked with Tangled um, because we want to recognize their expertise um, and their experience. Um, so language is. Let me think for a moment, Jack, sorry. Don't be sorry. That's a part of, I think, relaxed space is taking mm -hmm. time to process your thoughts. Um, so, I, oh, there we go. Okay, I got it. One of the great things, um, and, and I'm going to be mentioning this person and their organization in the ASL interpretation section. Um, there's this amazing deaf artist and arts worker an activist, uh, Sage Lovell, who runs Deaf Spectrum. And what Sage was talking to me about was, um, we're talking about how we are thinking about translating documents into plain language, but we also need to start thinking about translating more things into ASL and not just like announcements and things like that, but things like say on the Tangled website, I have an explanation about our Ontario Arts Council recommender grants, and it has all the steps. Having that in ASL, not only plain language, is much more useful for a lot of deaf people. Um, and I think really it's just the idea that every time I do research, language comes up as a barrier for people. And it's just, it, 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 what I'm hoping to do in the future, though COVID has changed this, is bring together artists and arts workers to brainstorm around specific language that organizations are using that is inaccessible and ways we can work around it. Um, but that's going to look a lot differently, obviously, now. Um, so. Um, do, are there any questions or? Oh, hang on. Uh, there's a comment from Barb. Um, she said, I love when successful artists use plain language in their artist statements. Their courage shows me that this is an excess, that this is acceptable to grantors and galleries. Yes. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, Trepidation, like a lot of people don't want to be using art speak, but they feel like they have to. And I, this issue has come up, I think it's, it's, I've read about it being an issue kind of in like the softer sciences where because we're sometimes attacked for whether or not what we're doing has worth, we get more defensive in our writing without realizing that we're doing it. So we make it more complex and we use bigger words even though we don't need to because we're trying to buffer ourselves from those kinds of, oh, what are you doing? Like, this doesn't, this doesn't matter. This isn't, this is meaningless. It's, you know, all of those wonderful things that people say about art. Um, so it's, it's, I think it really does show both courage and um, like a comf like a security in what you're saying when you're using plain language um, because you're not you're not obscuring it at all. So um. That's okay. it. <laughs> So we're going to move into our section about how you book ASL interpretation and captioning. So, um, and as just a reminder, when we shift between ASL and captioning, we will be uh, switching who is sharing the screens. Yes. We'll try and warn you. We're, we're being equitable and sharing our speaking time. <laughs> um, so. ASL and interpretation. Oops, hang on. I just need my my notes because it is a digital workshop, so I have physical notes in front of me. <laughs> um, so ASL and interpretation. Oops, wait. There we go. So question one. This is something that comes up a lot. 
why should we use ASL and not just captioning? So ASL is not signed English. It is its own language. Um, there is signing that is signed English. It is called C. It is signed exact English. It is not ASL. Um, English, uh, ASL has its own grammar, its own conventions, its own ways of communicating nuance that hearing people get from listening and ASL signers get through ASL. Um, so another reason to use ASL interpretation is captioning is only a transcription of the words being spoken. So because it is only a transcription, as I said, ASL has its own way of communicating different nuance that hearing people get through listening to other people. Um, and it's something that's lost when you're just doing a transcription of the words. The other thing is that live captioning is often inaccurate, especially when it's being auto captioned. The tools are getting a lot better, but ASL is still going to be preferred for ASL speakers because it is going to be more accurate and it is going to be in their language, in their first language. We've been talking about this, we've mentioned it multiple times, first language. Um, so, oh, and um, ideally, really, we want to be using both because different people need different access, uh, uh, different accommodated, different access requirements. And I'm already that funny, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and not everybody who needs captioning signs. Um, so we, we use both. Um, so oh, I've only recently started using animations in my slides and you can see that I did not do this one completely correctly. So we're gonna talk about, there's actually two different types of interpreters. Um, so the first type is the, like the two wonderful people we have today, they're ASL interpreters. There's another type of interpreters and they are deaf interpreters. So ASL interpreters, yeah, I messed up the animations on this one. So are hearing and they have ASL as a second language. And I put an asterisk and I put usually because there are probably some exceptions where somebody is uh, what is called a coda, a child of deaf adults or grew up in the deaf culture. And in that case, the line might be a little more blurred. Um, deaf interpreters have ASL as their first language and they are advocated, um, they're being advocated to be used more. That is a very awkward phrasing. They're being advocated for by the community um, because um, it gives, it, there's a couple of reasons. It, it, it gives back agency, but it also improves the translation and they work in different ways. Um, so deaf interpreters can work alone or in tandem with hearing interpreters. Um, so if they're working alone, it's often for things that might be scripted or um, uh, translating a document. Um, it's, um, but when you're working in, when they're working in tandem with hearing interpreters, um, what can happen is the, you'll have the person who is speaking and then the ASL interpreter will interpret it to the deaf interpreter who will then interpret it for the deaf person. And it just, it can really improve the communication, especially in um, like sensitive situations. It can be really good. However, it can, can I, sorry. Pardon? I, I was just gonna say, uh, fun fact, if you have been keeping up with COVID news, um, in the UK, I think there was a few statements made recently with an interpreter, um, and he is actually a deaf interpreter. And it, behind the scenes, there is a hearing interpreter across the room um, that's working with him. Just as a fun fact of someone who is a very uh, publicized deaf interpreter. And also it creates job opportunities. Yeah, that is the other thing. It's, it's this thing of, um, and I, I, we never really see this when we talk about like, pay gaps and um, unemployment, we tend to leave out disabled people um, and disabled people and deaf people and mad people, we all have much higher rates of unemployment. And that's not even accounting for the fact that 
Um, there's a lot of people who aren't counted in those statistics because they've just given up looking for work because nobody will hire them and they're no longer counted as unemployed, even though they can work and they would work if anybody would hire them. Um, so it's also about creating, creating more jobs because I did joke recently that disabled people, we create a lot of jobs and the world kind of needs us because what would unemployment do if all of a sudden we didn't exist? <laughs> <laughs> right and and yeah but it's also the tool of how ableism keeps us oppressed is that then we make it we yeah it employment it's fun um so deaf interpretation um it's a great option in arts for a bunch of things it's a great option for performance art for scripted material, for translating written documents. As I said before, um, I, it's, it's been said to me like translating some like more complex documents is a really useful. Um, and for live events. So as Jack said uh, recently, like you have your ASL interpreter off camera and you have your deaf interpreter in the front and yeah. Um, so, uh, we are going to move into how do we book ASL and deaf interpreters. So um, there are two organizations I'm going to point you towards right now, um, especially when you're getting started. Once you have more experience in booking interpreters, you'll really just start emailing them yourself and build up that relationship. Um, but when you're getting started out, it can be overwhelming. So you can go to these two different services one is Deaf Spectrum, and uh, it is uh, run by an amazing Deaf artist, Sage Level, and they have different services that they do. They do ASL vlogs as well, um, and they also coordinate ASL and Deaf interpreters. So you can go to their site, and they will help you out with that. Um, and they'll also kind of help you through, like the, the form that they have on their site, is very good and it kind of it guides you through a lot of what you need to know. Um, so then there's the Canadian Hearing Services. Uh, they can coordinate ASL and deaf interpretation as well, as well as live captioning, which Jack will be going into. Um, there are two different places you go if you're looking into interpreting services or like ASL or if you're looking at deaf interpreting. Um, but when you're booking them, can you book just one interpreter? You'll notice we have two interpreters here. It's because um, interpreting is a demanding job. It is, it, it takes a lot of mental effort because you are translating live and it's also, uh, it's a physical thing. So as you've noticed, our interpreters have been switching out about every 15 minutes. Um, there we go. And so depending on the size and length of your event, you may need multiple interpreters. If you are not sure how many you need, the interpreters in the booking service can help you figure out how many to book. Um, so, so now you know about that. What about budgeting? So budgeting and when you want to book it. So for budgeting, Rates vary from between 100 and 150 per hour per interpreter. Um, they set the fees, we pay them. <laughs> um, uh, so just to, that's, and then for when to book, you want to look at for smaller events, three to four weeks in advance minimum. And for larger events, and this is gotten off of stage on Deaf Spectrum, two to three months is what they recommend. Um, basically, book it as, as soon as you know you're having the event, start looking at your access and start booking it um, because uh, there, we need more interpreters uh, is basically the story. Um, and, and the good ones are often booked up. So get them early. Uh, and um, just if I could jump in for a second, I think... Uh, yeah. I, I can say that on my part of having come in as a coordinator for several events, like halfway through a project or event, basically 
every time there has been a failure of booking interpreters, uh, interpreters, it, it's been because there wasn't a foundational budget set aside. Um, and so I think also really like when you are first starting your project and outlining your budget, try and put these numbers out. And I would say, go over what you think they might end up being um, just to be safe, even though you're most likely going to get exactly what you see here. Um, because I, I can tell you that is 99% of the time I have seen conflicts with booking interpreters as people, uh, they get to a week or two before the event and then realize they didn't put any money aside. So make it, you know, I think making it a priority is an important thing. Mm -hmm. And I know, I believe Sin, who is our executive director at Tangled, recommends 10% uh, of your budget going towards access. Because um, there is this idea, it's, it's a double whammy of um, people always think anything to do with accessibility costs money, and it doesn't, and that's not true. And that's a harmful idea. But then on the same flip side, some access does cost money and it's worth that money. Um, so, so now we've been talking about like glitches and things. What can I ask? What can you ask to help make the event run smoothly? So if you are getting interpret booking interpretation for a specific person, ask them if they have any preferred interpreters. A lot of people like working with the same people because it's familiar, you get a good relationship going, you understand each other better because you're communicating with each other. And that interpreter is their access to the communication. So having a good relationship is really important. If the interpretation is for a more general event, kind of like this one is, ask the interpreter if they have any preferred Teamsters. So it's kind of the same idea. You're working, it's a communication job. You want people to be working, to be able to work with the people that they communicate best with. And we should respect that. So you've booked your interpreters, you've budgeted it for it. Your event's coming up, what kind of prep materials do interpreters need? Because interpreters and captioners, as Jack will say, need prep material. So at least one week in advance. And I'm going to take this moment to call myself out and apologize to our interpreters because I didn't get it to them until Tuesday this week. <laughs> and, um, but really, really try and get it out as soon as you can, like at least a week in advance. Um, and the things you want to get out are things like the agenda with time estimates and breaks so they can like figure out how they want to run the event for themselves, what works best for them, your speaking notes or your slides, um, names of the participants and any important names in the presentation. I think briefly we did have a moment where we could see some of our prep material when Jack was having some technical issues and you could see at the top we had the names. It's useful because while ASL is not English, it does use for certain words and for names, finger spelling to spell them out. So it's important for interpreters to know that in advance because finger spelling is often a very quick thing. And, you know, yeah. Um, so what about hosting interpreted events on digital platforms? So, um, and we did talk about this a little bit already, but Interpreters need to either be pinned by participants or spotlighted by the organizers. Um, this is both because I have had events in the past where there have been technical issues on the participants end and we have needed to spotlight the interpreters from our end instead of them pinning on their end. Um, so just be aware of that um, and uh, make your interpreters the co-hosts um especially if you have multiple booked so as you'll notice our interpreters have been they swap out and different people like working in different ways so check with them um but uh but it just it makes it easier and it takes something off of your plate too not to have to worry about 
Um, you want to make sure your speaker's faces are visible and clear for anybody who might be relying on like facial recognition or lip reading. Um, and you'll notice too, and uh, this is great, a lot of interpreters are very good about having good, clear like backgrounds and you're able to see them clearly and see what they're signing and understand. And get explicit ex consent for recording. Um, I mean, this is like a general good thing across the board for anybody going to a recorded event that they might end up being in. Just make sure you get permission. <laughs> make sure they know. Um, and the last thing is promote your event. So here's the thing. We've been talking about a lot of access things and these are all really great things to implement, but um, oh, I'm just sorry, I'm just looking at a, yes, I can definitely go back to that slide for you. Uh, wait, where was it? Wait, there it is. Um, And I would really recommend working with Sage. I would say like, it's it's the thing about relationship building and yeah. Um, so promoting your event, like, so as I said, we've been talking about all of these access features and they're great to start implementing into how you're operating, but the outreach as Jack said, has to go along with that because otherwise the people who didn't have access to your events before because it wasn't accessible won't know about it because they won't be paying attention to what you're doing. So uh, oh. oh I'm missing a hang on. Okay, so um so let me go to the I'm just gonna skip back to that last slide. So um you can reach out to Deaf Spectrum for a promotion. They're really great at that. Um, uh, and they have a great relationship with the community. You can also reach out to the Deaf Cultural uh, Center. Um, I recommend both. Um, and it's also the idea of, and I'm sure Christina mentioned this as well, but of making sure when you're promoting your events that you include all of the access features in it because it removes a lot of work and it also means disabled people are more likely to check out what you're doing and deaf people are more likely to check out what you're doing and mad people because they have the information and a lot of times we are forced to go after that information ourselves and it's tiring and we don't always get a great response and so sometimes it makes you just not want to bother because you're going to get into an argument yet again about what your access needs are so it, it's really great when we can provide that information up front because it does two things. One, it provides the information and two, it shows to the community that you are trying and that you are willing to discuss accommodations and access. And it makes it easier for people to approach you and ask you about it. Um, so that is the end of mine. Are there any questions for other questions for this one? Um, oops. And what I will be doing in the outro is I'm going to share all of the links in the chat from what we've had from Jack and I, um, with a little quick description. And Jack has disappeared now off screen, as he said, because it is getting dark. <laughs> I was shrouded um, in darkness. Um, I'm, is it okay if I begin to share my screen now? I do believe so. It looks like I, I addressed the one question we've right. got. So um, yeah. as I, um, everyone is so kind and patient as I make sure this is working. One other thing I wanted to say about um, getting interpretation as well is uh, make sure to name your interpreters oh. in your event. Uh, you know, with like any community, there's a very intricate and complex relationship between the deaf community and interpreters. And it's not necessarily our place as hearing people 
to always have an opinion on, but we can simply contribute and help our audience know what they're getting into by naming interpreters so that they can decide for themselves if they're comfortable um, or if we feel safe. Um, because, you know, there's tons of things that go on in inter-community issues. And also, you know, it, it's just transparency's sake. Um, Victoria, I'm going to ask you if this looks okay. <laughs> it does look okay. And thank you for adding that in. I had it in my notes and it got lost at some point. Oh, um, no worries. It, it gives me a minute to linger on this little graphic I made. <laughs> it's so pretty, and I will have to in, uh, integrate that the, those flowers into my slides for the next <laughs> Since now awesome. we have the slides together for it, so. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about captioning, my favorite, favorite thing, because I am someone who definitely relies on it um, and finds it. It's one of those things that you don't realize you rely on until you have it. Um, so captioning services. Why bring in captioning? Well, it provides access to anyone who is deaf and perhaps ASL isn't their first language. I mean, deaf and hard of hearing folks are just as diverse as any group of people. And there are definitely those who are part of autism uh, with a D so oppression against deaf people is a lot of them were uh, not allowed to learn ASL. Um, and so there are deaf people out there who do not have access to their own language. So captioning can be another access point for that. Um, and I've, I've been told that having both as said is very helpful, um, especially, you know, if you're watching an interpreter and then there's a presentation you can kind of go back and forth, but it's also really helpful for tons of other people. Like if you have auditory processing issues or difficulty mentally organizing information, like those with ADHD might, um, or you have English as a second language. And also it provides you a written transcript that you can use as reference later. And I think sometimes this is a good way to get an archive or a reference of an event or something you are doing without necessarily having to record everybody um, in breach consent in that way. So I think captioning is just A plus. <laughs> it's my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, so I want to get into so different kinds of captioning. Um, the first is live captioning. And that's kind of broken into two parts. So there's standard live captioning. This is what you see on TV during news channel, uh, weather channel, things like that. Uh, it, they're provided a script in advance. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on what you're doing, this requires integration with the program client to feed captions live. So if you're using Zoom or, you know, for example, you're using a broadcast, um, there will be some technical integration. Usually I find captioning companies take care of most of it for you and they try and make it as simple as possible. Um, and this is ideal for performances with scripts, uh, events that won't have audience participation, anything that's predictable and workable. Um, I, I don't use standard live captioning too much. I find in access work, I rely much more heavily on CART, which stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, this one, because you don't have a script, it requires a lot of preparatory materials, very similar to ASL, and I'll get into in the next few slides what kind of materials to provide. This also requires integration with your program client to feed captions live. Most of these, uh, by the way, they, most of these already, especially the pandemic, they already know how to work with Zoom or other kind of programs, especially since Zoom does have a captioning service within it. So usually it's just a matter of finding the technical uh, collaboration. The thing about CART, just to keep in mind, is it does require um, a feed so that they can hear what is going on. When I use this for a conference, we had you know one microphone feeding, um, and it usually has to be quite high quality, but they can go through a phone, they can go through a, a microphone. Um, you know, They'll let you know their own things, but basically they'll hear what's going on through the microphone, and then they will live feed it, usually through some kind of website that's streaming live um, or integrating. With Zoom. So there is a little bit of technical uh, things with CART, 
but I, in my experience, they've been very patient. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely, as you may have noticed, not the most tech savvy necessarily. Uh, and I never had any problems and, and they explained things to me very simply. Um, and you also have to remember most captioning services are built for access. So they're access minded. So they're pretty used to dealing with that. Um, and CART is ideal for any live events, workshops, conferences, interactive works. Uh, we use them for artist talks at Tangled, uh, meetings, anything like that. Um, yeah, okay. And then the next form of captioning is auto captioning. Uh, this is often free and low cost or low cost, uh, simple and painless setup. Most of these are set up on a like separate website page. So, you know, it'll feed through Zoom, for example and you'll have the separate window open where it's coming through. This requires basically no prep materials, usable on all platforms. Um, it only sometimes integrates with meeting clients. So I made the point, I have a few auto captioning programs listed. There's Otter AI, Google Meets, and Rev. Rev integrates with Zoom. It is also the one that costs money. Although it's a very neg negligible amount, in my opinion, for a captioning service. Um, and it, I mean, granted it's auto, so it'll never be as accurate as live captioning. Um, but I've had pretty good experiences with Rev. Um, the thing that's nice though about the first one, Otter AI, is you can actually submit names and terms to it so that it won't uh, misspell things. And that's really good for land acknowledgements if you're working with uh, indigenous artists or artists, you know, of any like non-Western names or things like that. So you're not dealing with the awful AI misspelling, which, you know, is like a callous reminder of racism in technological development, right? Um, so I, I tend to recommend Otter AI or Rev, depending on your needs. Just keep in mind the thing with Otter AI or anything like that is because you have to open a separate window, that can be extremely distracting for anyone who's relying on the captioning. Like, they pretty much can't watch uh, the video or anything else going on because you have to have a whole separate window. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's not ideal, but it's also, it's better than having nothing. Uh, so um, Jack. It, yep. Uh, we had a question about um, uh, Otter AI costing money. Does it cost money? Um, uh, sorry. Oh, okay. I su <laughs> okay, I suppose I have been using it for free off someone else's dollar and dime, <laughs> and I didn't Oh, it realize. does have a free version, that's why. Oh, okay. I'm also just uh, reading up on, uh, I just want to make sure I'm up to do date with the, uh... all right, thank you for, yeah, the integrating to Zoom, it makes sense that that costs money. I think I've only used the free version where you have to open it on a separate, um, window, which honestly, as someone who relies on captioning, I, I don't love it, <laughs> but you know, if you're like a freelance worker and that's all you have access to, I understand. And someone also recommended the program Trint, T-R-I-N-T. And then someone said Google meets, you can have a not for profit account. So the service has become free and the captions are the same window. Thank you, everybody. Um, so booking captioners, these, those, as we listed the auto captioning and really genuinely thank you everyone for um, reaching in because I tend to rely on live captioners. So I don't use the auto captioning too much. So I, I don't know as much about it as live captioners. These are some of the companies just I recommend and I've worked with um, AI Live and CCS, uh, both completely lovely. Um, the costs vary because there's different types of services you can ask for. But I find, you know, it's usually 150 an hour, but it can go between that. I put Deaf Spectrum here because uh, as you will see in the uh, in a future slide, there's specific types of captioning that you should get a deaf person to go over. So I just quickly wanted to go over what kind of prep materials do you need for captioning services? This is geared uh, it, trans, for transparency sake, this is definitely geared towards CART um, because that, that's just who I work with the most in the context of things. And so very similar things to booking interpreters. You provide them the agenda with estimates and breaks, speaking notes and slides, 
names of participants and important names in the presentation. Um, I also find CART folks really, really, uh, they're extremely engaged in what they're trying to uh, transcribe for you. And so I, they, I find often they want the context and the meaning of what you're doing. When, when I used CART for uh, the relaxed performance training, they really did want to know all of the meaning behind relaxed performance so that they could understand everything going on and really uh, deeply understand the material, which is something extremely lovely about them. And also any specialized terminology like, you know, like autism or ableism, like, you know, terms they may not have heard before. Um, just to make sure they're up to date on everything. And then just very quickly, and I can see we're getting some chat messages. So I'll, I'll look at that. Um, this is my last slide. Um, just some additional digital tools that you can access. Uh, audio description, which can be live, pre-recorded, or integrated into a recording at a later date. And for those you may not know, audio description is very much like, you know, the visual description is someone sitting there describing everything that has happened as it goes. Um, when we're not in COVID times, this could, you know, be something, uh, a little device someone is putting in their ear during the show. It can also be a literal live person next to them, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This provides access to people from the blind and low vision community. And there's new forms being developed every day. My friend and audio describer, Kat Germain, is currently trying to develop relaxed audio description, which has me extremely excited. So that's why I'm bringing it up, uh, which is the, almost going through a performance uh, like a relaxed performance to help autistic youth connect meaning to what they're seeing. So, you know, it'll warn right before things happens and sound happens as you're going through rather than only at the beginning. It's, it's still something that's in the works. It's completely brand new and she's quite inventing it herself, but just an example of um, audio description possibilities. And then I also did put here ASL to English translation. Uh, and that's why I put Death Spectrum on for captioning because when you are translating ASL for English for captioning, um, it's usually best to work with an ASL speaker um, rather than just using the transcript, depending on the situation, just to have a more accurate understanding of the content. Um, and this is ideal for captioning works that are made by deaf or hard of hearing artists, um, as we're talking about making sure to get that cultural context of the work and what is being uh, presented. So we are at about the 10 minute mark. Mm -hmm. I'm just glancing at the chat because I see a lot happened. Well, <laughs> oh, Jack, this is what I was thinking. We had a few good questions and comments around integrating, um, how you can integrate different um, captioning services, the auto ones into Zoom. And I think maybe that's something we could go into more depth next week. Absolutely. Um, because uh, then it can be a little more specific. We've covered all the basics and now we can, we can get a little more into the nitty gritty of it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, fantastic. So this is a good time. Uh, if anyone has any questions about all that. And I did, I would like to say it loud just because we like to try and if it's, there's a question we'll, we'll say it out loud. So there was a question about, should you have interpreters regardless of whether or not there are deaf hard of hearing or disabled people in attendance. Um, so what I had said was if the event is public, then you should be trying to book interpreters. Um, if it's private or closed, then book based on need. And um, Kay added, and this is perfect, so I'm just gonna read it. Um, uh, they said if uh, they could give their local perspective, um, there's a lot of pressure on deaf, and hard of hearing folks, if you don't, uh, because if you don't hire unless someone RSVPs or needs it to show up because it's for them, it puts pressure on folks if they get sick or they can't attend because it can create animosity in the community. Um, so by having interpreters just anyways at your public events, it uh, normalizes the practice and it shows folks that they will be there uh, when they invite folks from the community. So um, I thought that was great. And thank you for adding that, Kay. Um, yeah. 
That's absolutely perfect. And you should be putting it in your uh, budgets anyway, regardless. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, it's no harm, no foul. I think it's just best to have them. Yeah, awesome. And uh, yeah, if there's any other questions, because we're at the end and we're gonna do a quick outro before we go, but if anyone has any questions about this specific material or anything else we've talked about, feel free to drop it in the chat. If not, I think we can uh, move to the outro.